Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris or VeloSews on social media. Welcome back to Sober 50 Podcast on So Organised Style. And we're about to start the Top 20 Countdown. And I sewed throughout my childhood to the point that I got my first sewing machine for my 14th birthday. So that was my own sewing machine, which I was tremendously excited about. It was a Toyota. It weighed an absolute ton. It was solid metal. And I still have it upstairs. It's still a great machine. It can go through denim like butter. Jen Hogg was my first guest from the Great British Sewing Bee in November 2020 because Jen is a strong supporter of the Sober 50 community. She came back in August 2021 to record a podcast to support So 50 Sustainable Sewing. And what you'll hear in her note that she sent us about her achievements since November 2020 is how sustainability is an important part of what she does full time. The full version of Jen's letter is on her podcast blog post. So what I'm going to do is read you out a short version of Jen's note to us about what she's achieved since November 2020 in the same way as Lady Whistledown in the Bridgerton series would write her newsletters to the public. Dearest gentle podcast listener, well, an awful lot has happened since 2020. I've continued to design tools and notions for my own use and then added them to my business. In 2021, I came up with the Generates Seam Circles, an easy and quick way to add and remove an amount from any shape. These are a continuation of the drafting cutouts I'd included on my sewing rulers and they've been featured in magazines and books all over the world. An exciting moment was to see them in Threads magazine alongside some of my sewing heroes. Then in 2022, I invented the silicon hot hammer. That went crazy straight away and I've sent them all over the world. The hammers and seam circles became and still are my biggest sellers. Moving forward to 2023, I launched the Generates Pattern Tracker. Another popular tool, but this time it's something that I've invented for my knitting and crochet. It was lovely to add this strong design tool for my knitting because I've knitted for as long as I've sewn. So that's one big idea a year. And I do have a couple of things in the pipeline, so watch this space. Along the way, I've also added my versions of existing tools like seam and yarn, weight gauges, stitch markers and so on. My tailor's wax is popular and I'm in the middle of completing a wholesale order for over 2,000 tins. Everything I do is made locally to me in Glasgow. My production partners are another small business and I love that we've become friends. All of the wood I use is FSC approved and the acrylic is 100% recycled and recyclable. I package my products without plastic and hand stamp my tins because I like the individuality it gives and it also avoids overproduction. Now, as Jen states here, I'm still a one-person business, but I take on assistance when I need to. My daughter has just arrived back from a gap year in Australia, so I'll be roping her in. Between my online sales, wholesale orders, selling at sewing shows and yarn fest, the business has become more than full-time. And I'm thinking about how I manage expansion. Oh, and I run the Sewing the Gather retreats four or five times a year at a textile world heritage site in Scotland just to use up any spare time. So listeners, I hope that you'll go to the podcast blog post to read the full letter from Jen. Let's listen to where Jen started off in November 2020. Today's So Over 50 guest is from Glasgow. Jen Hogg was also a great British Sewing Bee contestant on Series 5. Let's welcome Jen today. So over 50, what a force for good. Jen, thanks for coming on to the podcast today. It's a real treat having you for Sober 50 Thursday. You're more than welcome. It's my pleasure. Usually I ask people if they could tell us what their Instagram name, but I think for you it would be your name and how you've been using social media since you were on the Great British Sewing Bee last year. Yeah, sure. I mean, Instagram's been a bit of a revelation, actually. So my name's Jen Hogg. And as you say, Maria, I was on the Great British Sewing Bee last year, which was Series 5, which we filmed actually in 2018. 
It takes a few months for them to process, to edit everything. And when we were filming, as a group of sewers, we decided that we would focus on Instagram rather than Facebook. And to tell you the truth, I had an Instagram account. I do quite a lot of photography and I had an Instagram account for that. And I really like the visual aspect of Instagram. But I hadn't realised what an absolute strength the sewing community is on Instagram at all. I just wasn't part of that scene. I opened up a new account with my Instagram name Generates. And obviously the telly effect happened. Yeah. So I have a lovely number of followers. It's just been a joy. And kind of found my Instagram voice, I guess, and realised that the sewing community on Instagram is incredibly supportive. When we were filming, when the programme went out, I was really lucky because I got a lot of support and it was a, a joy for me from start to finish, really. A couple of my pals had some moments on social media which weren't so pleasant and Twitter was toxic and Facebook was not much better. But Instagram felt almost wholly supportive. It felt like a safe place. So I'm a fan of Instagram and not the other social medias. Well, that's really good to hear. A lot of the time when we have guests on for so over 50, they feel very supported within the community on Instagram and they love the idea that they can talk about whatever and their views are held as, how can I put it? What, valid? Yeah, valid and that they accept that you've got a view, I've got a view and we can still be really great mates. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right, actually. It does, it's maybe more polite and maybe that's, you know, maybe my perception of it as part of the sewing community is, isn't is everybody's experience. You know, again, may- maybe we're just a particularly nice bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> but I think sewing is one of these things. Again, maybe because we tend to sit in our houses and it's a solo activity usually. So there's the joy of meeting other sewers And you can actually talk about fabric and patterns and technical things without your person you're speaking to glazing over. And also, I find it very collegiate. It's very supportive generally. So if you have a question or you've done something that's gone wrong, you get nothing but support and advice and help. It seems to me that there's a a real lack of competition among us. And we're all much more willing to help each other. Whereas I'm guessing in other fields there's maybe a bit more of a a competitive edge. Maybe that's wrong, but um, certainly the sewing community, I don't think has that competitive element, which is lovely. It's it's just a lovely thing. It is a lovely thing. I think that's why the Sober 50 community in particular continues to grow every month, which is really lovely to see. Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? I'm such a fan. I actually joined. I spoke to Judith. When we were filming, I hadn't quite turned 50. I was 50 last year. And so I sneaked in early. (laughs) But I really like the the fact that it gives a voice to a sector of society, predominantly women and our age group, which is generally a sector which doesn't have a voice. And it's tremendous. It's just brilliant to see. And great with the successes in having pattern companies actually use older models and to be just aware of the fact that this community is here and we want a voice and we want acknowledgement. That's a great thing. I think it's a force for good. It is. Now, your sewing journey, that started quite early, didn't it? Oh, I don't remember being taught to sew at all or knit. You know, my gran was a terrific sewer and knitter. She had a treadle singer machine and I can remember that in her house. I reckon I was probably an annoying wee one who would kind of tug at her skirt saying, oh, can I have a shot? Can I have a shot? I literally don't remember being taught. And I sewed throughout my childhood to the point that I got my first sewing machine for my 14th birthday. So that was my own sewing machine, which I was tremendously excited about. It was a Toyota, weighed an absolute ton. It was solid metal. And I still have it upstairs. It's still a a great machine. It can go through denim like butter. The talking is great. You know, limited number of stitches, obviously. But I I used that machine till I was 40. I'm still very fond of it. So you said that you also do photography as well. Yeah, I do a lot of different things. I'm interested in photography and I I went to college classes for that. Silversmithing, that was another of my college forays. I knit, I felted, I've I've done most textile crafts, weaving, I've got a knitter's um, loom. And then I've also done things like I do quite a lot of DIY. 
and I've done stained glass and wrought iron, which was fantastic fun. Yes, I do a pottery. Oh, this is my, this is one of my mugs. Oh, your mug. It's very wealthy. Yeah, so I'm using my own mug. When I first brought this home, this mug, it was my first piece out of the kiln from like the class that I went to. And it's slab built. So if you know pottery, that means it, it's, if, if you make something on the wheel, it's a much more even um, weight of clay. And so it doesn't distort as much as it dries. If you slab build something, it distorts a bit. So this is fairly distorted. And I brought it home and I was really proud of it. And I showed my husband, I said, look what I made. I've made a mug for myself. And he took it and he said, gosh, pottery must be really hard because you're normally pretty good at this kind of thing. <laughs> God bless him. I know, that really made me laugh. So I take great pleasure in using my wonky mug. <laughs> I think like a lot of us, if you're a maker, you're a maker. And, you know, I get a bit antsy if I don't have things on the go creatively. You know, I used to do drawing and painting, but it's, for me, it's all about making. So I'm curious, prior to 2018 and to now, has there been much of a change? So has being on the bee influenced what you do? Yeah, being on the sewing bee has massively influenced what I do. The biggest change, and interestingly, I think that all of us would agree, we, we were chatting the other night actually, and all of us who are on it, I think would say the biggest change is in your confidence because you're asked to do things in an impossibly short period of time with no preparation on some things that you would never normally take on. So for example, in my series, I think it was maybe episode four, we were asked to make a swimsuit for the pattern challenge. So you have no idea. You go in, you don't have any idea of what it is they're going to ask you to do. You're given this pattern. They say you've got two and a half hours. There's a fabric. Go. And literally it's like that. I mean, you know, there's no extra time that's built in that the viewer doesn't see. And so you just go into doing mode and you get your fabric and you get on the machine and you make a swimsuit. And, you know, it's not bad. Is really not bad. My swimsuit actually suffered. My, my machine struggled to cope with the elastic, which obviously if I'd had more time, I could have sorted out. It's that confidence of being able to tackle things that probably I would have found daunting in real life. And then, of course, you kind of stop and you, you've made this swimsuit or the tracksuit or whatever it is. And you think, crikey, I made that in two and a half hours. That's a bit crazy. So, it's, yeah, I, I'd say that the biggest change is really in the level of my confidence. And also, I found it hard to switch off from sewing. So prior to filming, as I say, I was doing a lot of different making projects, particularly silversmithing. I was doing a lot of jewellery, both at college and at home. And when I got back from filming, because you're down in London for the duration, really, of the filming, as soon as I got home, I couldn't stop sewing. And to the point that when I went to my silversmithing classes at the college, I just couldn't think of anything I wanted to make. And in the end, I started making buttons and enameling them. So I've now got this big stash of enamel buttons because everything was about sewing. And that's actually not really abated since. So the majority of my creative time is still spent on the sewing machine, which, of course, has had a knock on effect on my skill level, on my technical ability. You know, it's, it would, it's every day is a school day, isn't it, when you're sewing and you're constantly learning. So I, I feel like I've learned so much since we stopped filming. And the other aspect to that as well is that I've now got this terrific set of sewing friends who are very, very good through the programme, I mean. So I regularly chat to them and you realise that we all have slightly different ways of doing some things. And so the way that, you know, I might do a facing for the neck of a top, say, that's now morphed a bit because I've picked up something from Janet. I've picked up something from Mercedes. All these things. I've picked up things from Instagram. So it's a constant development. It's a, a constant state of change, I think, really. Jen, prior to being on the Great British Sewing Bee, were you a deadline sewer or were you a slow sewist? Prior to filming the Sewing Bee, I wasn't so much a deadline sewer. But I certainly tend to finish sewing projects. I tend to have one or two sewing projects on the go at a time, which I will complete. Whereas knitting is my slow task. So my knitting projects, obviously, they take longer because it's a slower craft. And I enjoy the contrast between the speed of sewing and the slowness of knitting. 
So I will have a number of knitting projects on the go that I pick up when I'm watching telly, I'll sit now on it. And I quite like the fact that they're slow and sewing is fast. So I didn't realise until we filmed that I was quite as fast as I am. I think I've probably speeded up. And I think the reason I did quite well in the sewing bee was actually because I can be quite accurate at speed, which I, was not a skill that I knew I possessed. Why would you know that? There we go. Apparently I can sew a straight line really quickly. Yay for me. I would say that I was never a deadline sewer, but I am a project completer with sewing. That's how I describe myself. <laughs> That's a lot of discovery that you went through while you were on the Great British Sewing Bee. The experience of filming the Sewing Bee is a revelation in yourself, really, because you realise lots of different things, not just about how you sew, what you can sew, how quickly you can sew. Obviously, you're under a huge amount of pressure. And the environment is completely foreign to me, you know, with the studio lights and the cameramen and constantly being kind of aware, you know, you're mic'd up so they can hear everything you say to the point where I was aware that I had to speak a bit more slowly than normal. And I'm, I'm actually speaking a wee bit more slowly than normal right now because Scots are notorious for speaking fast. And if I was talking to my husband right now, you probably wouldn't understand me because we'd be going 90 to the dozen. So, you know, even to the point where I had to kind of moderate my, my speaking speed and I didn't manage the whole time. At times I knew I was I was lapsing into my normal Scots speed and this would be challenging if you weren't Scottish, as any accent is, you know. And myself and Ben and Ricardo, we all did that at times. But yeah, you learn a huge amount about yourself. Before you go on, obviously there's a process to go through in the kind of selection process. And the last stage of that is actually a psychiatric evaluation. And that's to make sure that you know what's coming and you're prepared. Um, And I think also to an extent to protect the brand of Sewing Bee, to make sure there's not something that's going to come out or, you know, your behaviours, you're not going to want to carry on with it. You know, there's, there's obviously they have a brand to protect. And the psychiatrist said to me, she said, oh, how do you plan to be in front of the camera? And I said to her, well, I don't think I can do anything other than be myself, because when you're under that much pressure, you might think, oh, I'm going to have this smile and I'm going to behave this way. But when you're under pressure like that, you're going to be yourself. So I thought there's no point in even, you know, thinking about doing anything other than be myself. So even that is a revelation. That's quite a nerve wracking revelation, because then actually what you're doing is you are making yourself quite exposed because here I am on this telly with you know four million viewers on this program and I am you know as I say being myself and you have no idea when that comes onto the telly how that's going to be received are people going to think my goodness who is that mad Scottish woman with the crazy hair you know you have no idea and that was nerve-wracking and again I also learned that I'm more vain than I realised because I was nervous about that. I was nervous about how I was going to be perceived. Before we filmed, I just said to you, I'm not somebody who really cares what other people think about me particularly. I'm quite secure in myself. And, you know, but actually, I did have that anxiety. So um, even that was a revelation. So at any point in time prior to production, did you feel like you would want to step out and not be on the B? The story of how I kind of ended up on it I saw a flyer in my local fabric shop and I thought oh that that'll be a laugh to apply for that I'll never get anywhere so I filled out the application form which is a a lengthy thing and actually really interesting to fill out because it asks you about your sewing history and why you sew and why you're applying and makes you think about it and then they phoned me and I thought oh that's a laugh that they phoned me that won't go any further and then they phoned me again and every time they say well thanks very much If we want to carry on, we'll let you know. So every time I thought, well, I won't hear from them again. That'll be fine. And it was actually only when, I mean, they asked me to go down to London for an audition and a screen test. And I thought, oh, that'll be a good jaunt down to London. That'll be the end of that. It was only when they said to me, right, can you come and meet the psychiatrist lady? That I thought, oh, my goodness, this might actually happen. And do I want to be on telly? But at that point, then... I thought, well, if I get offered this chance, I shouldn't turn it down because at the very least, it will be interesting to do. 
And so I, th I thought, I just have to, I have to go for this. I said to one of the producers, just before we started filming, I said, I have no idea why I'm, I'm doing this. I don't want to be on telly. <laughs> and he said, actually, he said, that's good. That's, that's a really good thing. That's what we need. Just we don't want people who are here because they want celebrity or something else. Actually, you know, it's, it's a good thing that you don't want to be on telly. And, and I'm so glad I did it. It was such an interesting experience and very good fun. And I've made such good friends from it. That's been the best thing, are, are my sewing bee friends. And also this, the kind of wider community that I've, I've found. So, yeah, it's been a real joy. Thanks for explaining all of that because it's one of the things that you think of after the fact or when you've been watching an episode and see what you've actually gone through each episode as well. Um, so speaking of prepping yourself, how did you know what sewing gear you would take with you? Were you given a listing or did you think, oh, I'm just going to think about X, Y, and Z and take that with me? Every week in the sewing bee, there are three different parts to it. There's a pattern challenge, which is unseen. And then there's the transformation challenge where you've got an hour and a half to transform something bizarre into something else bizarre, usually. And then there's the made to measure, which you have had in advance and you can work out what pattern you're going to sew and what fabric you're going to use. The studio provide everything you need, but you can take your own kit if you want to. And I took a fairly substantial, you know, I've got a, a toolkit box. So I had that full to the gunnels and I, I took that. And as I say, you're down in London for most of the filming. I got back to Glasgow once during the filming. So it's not like you're carting it up and down the road. My pal Janet came with a wheelie case. You know, she was even better than me. So she had more stuff. Alexi, he came with a jam jar with some stuff in it and a pin cushion on the top. <laughs> so we had a real variety among us of how much kit we brought. For me, I kind of wanted some things which were familiar, I think really for the comfort of it more than anything else. But of course, it's also really nice to get other sewing kits. The haberdashery was just fantastic. You know, it was just like a massive sweetie shop. That was really exciting. The first time I got into the haberdashery, I was like, oh, look at all this stuff. <laughs> and it's set up so beautifully as well that you would think that you're in a sweet shop. Totally. And this is a really, the aesthetics are lovely. They've actually changed the venue this year, I think. It's going to be in a different studio next year, the next series. Our studio was lovely and, and very kissy. I don't know if that's the word you know, and just kind of was really warm and it was a really nice space to work in. So despite the lights. How did you describe that again? Kusi. Kusi is a Scottish word, I guess, which means it's like a feel-good warmth factor. Was there one particular time while you're, sorry, I, I shouldn't actually be asking you all about the Great British Sewing Bee. It should be about you that I'm asking about. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because obviously in the sewing world, um, having done the Great British Sewing Bee is you know, people are really interested in it and they love the programme and I enjoy talking about it. You know, I'm really happy to chat about it and to share my experience with people. Okay. Actually, going back to the, the psychiatric evaluation, the psychiatrist is lovely and I was having a right laugh with her. And she said at one point, she said, but just, just wait, wait, wait. She said, just to be serious for a moment, she said, um, tell me. She said, you realise that if you're chosen to go on this programme and you choose to do it, she said, people will want to talk to you about your experience and they will be strangers to you and they will come up to you in the street and they will want to talk to you about your experience she said how will you feel about that and I looked at her and I said I live in Glasgow and she was completely oblivious to what I meant I said to her listen people in Glasgow talk to strangers anyway we're one of the chattiest cities in the world and you get on a bus in Glasgow and you come off having spoken to half the passengers it's just how it is. Glasgow and Dublin, I think, is the same. And uh, I said, it's, it's absolutely no problem for me to be talking to strangers. And, you know, after we filmed, it was just tremendous. I had the best experience up here. For me, the experience has just been lovely. The first time I went into town, episode one had aired. And by the time I got off the train, I'd been stopped by seven different people to talk about the programme. And that's just a joy. Early on, actually, when I was in the train station in town with my pal Ben, who was on the programme as well, and Ben and I are good friends, and we were heading back to the station and this girl spotted us. And she came up and she said, oh, you're Jen and Ben from the Sewing Bee. She said, 
and threw her arms around me and then threw her arms around Ben and gave us a huge hug. And she said, I just love it. So it was experiences like that that were just wonderful. And I, I really enjoyed, you know, sharing my experience with people because I would be interested. If the other way around, I would be interested. So it's always a pleasure to talk about it. That's lovely to hear that people where you live were embracing the fact that you were on the Great British Sewing Bee. I was quite astonished by the level of support that I got when I was on the television. Ben and I met during the audition process and really hit it off immediately. And then kind of looking back, I think actually they liked our friendship. And it's unusual to have two Scottish people in a programme like this. It's usually kind of one Celt from Scotland or Ireland, maybe Wales, you know. Anyway, they put two of us on, which was just fantastic. And we had such good fun. Then obviously I stayed on the programme for longer. And it felt like I had the support of the nation. You know, it was, it was really quite tremendous. And a lot of people still talk about that. I think I've got the furthest of any Scots. So I wish I could have brought it home for us, but, you know, I didn't do too badly. The, the level of support was amazing. You got into the top four, so that's fantastic. Yeah, I was really proud. Again, you do these things and you have no idea how you're going to get on. My daughter said to me, you know, how far do you think you'll get? And I was saying, I have absolutely no idea. I might get on there and everybody else is streets ahead of me in terms of ability, or I might go on and I might be fine. You know, you just have no idea at all. And actually, what I think you maybe don't realise or see as much, certainly in our series, I can't talk for other series because I obviously don't know the stories as well. But in our series, everybody on there can so like your dream. I mean, Tom, who went out in week one, has made some absolutely stunning garments. And he went out in week one. Sheila in week two, fantastic sewer. She's somebody I, I really respect her work. And she's just such an elegant lady. I'm really fond of her. So, you know, actually, we could also, we could also really well. As I say, I found out I can sew straight streams fast. So that, that was lucky for me. But, uh, you know, everybody has a high level of ability. And it's really great to hear that there is a very sane life after being on the Great British Sewing Bee because you've described the friendships that you've all got together and how you're still connected together. Yeah, we're, we're all still in regular touch. We did bond, I think, exceptionally well as a group. And, and that's credit to the producers who you know chose our group. And it's such an intense and unusual experience that I think you do kind of form friendships much more quickly than you would in real life. So in these programs, when people say, oh, you know, I'm, I love that person, they've become a really good friend. And, and you might think, yeah, you've met them for two minutes, you know, you're at it. But actually, it's true. And I think it's just the nature of the experience. It's such a kind of false environment in so many ways that you do bond with these people who are going through it with you. We were all, all 10 of us managed to get together for a Zoom a couple of nights ago. So that was terrific. The other thing that I think was lucky for us was that we were Joe's first year. So it was new for Joe as well. And we had a really great time. He's such a nice guy and is still in touch with us all as well. He's still part of our group when he can be. And I think that's, I think that was lucky that it was a new experience for all of us at that point. And to an extent as well, it'd been all fair for three years, the programme. So coming back, the production team, I'm guessing, you know, they, they weren't sure how it was going to be received so much. So there was an element of newness there too, which I think won't be replicated now. So yeah, it, it was, I think it was a very lucky time to go on the programme for me. From my perspective as a viewer and as someone who is in the sewing community, whenever I hear about the next series of Sewing Bee coming out, it's always exciting there's always a lot of really good talk about it. And while in Australia, we don't get the episode as it happens, we'll find any way that we can to try and see, you know, what's happening each episode. My best friend lives in Sydney. So I was talking to her, obviously, she, she knew that I was on it and so on. It was really interesting to see and to be part of the sewing community in Australia and New Zealand as well, because again, there's a huge amount of support. And um, I really want to come over, actually. I'm desperate to get some merino fabrics, so I need to come to New Zealand for that, don't I? <laughs> but yeah, it's been lovely. You can tell from Instagram when it comes on television in different countries. So, for example, we all noticed that we were starting to get lots of followers from Norway when it was being aired in Norway. And you realise as well where the kind of real pockets, I think, of sewing 
and particularly garment sewing exists around the world. So obviously there's the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and then the Scandinavian countries and Germany. I hadn't realised until after we were filming and I became part of this Instagram community. And as I say, kind of as that travelled around the world, it was only then that I realised that I really like German fashion. And a lot of the German patterns I really like and the Scandinavian patterns as well. So that's been another kind of learning curve for me as well as kind of just seeing the pockets of sewing around the world, how the communities are so similar, but with their own nuances. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess as well, because for you, obviously, things that are coming up on my Instagram feed just now are all about it being cold and, you know, my stove is on and I'm making this jumper and I'm making that warm coat. And obviously that's the wrong season for you. I love the kind of wider view it gives you. It does widen your view in so many ways. And I think the Silver 50s is fantastic for that. I, I really applaud the guys for what they've done with that. I've met Judith because she's just along the road from me in Edinburgh. She's not far away. So we've met a few times. And I, I know that she and Sandy and the others put in a huge amount of work. Can't be underestimated how much work it is for them. So I'm really happy to take a stint as a guest editor as and when they want me to, just to help out really and to continue to offer support. And that's just good fun. Basically, you know, I, I kind of have some photos, I write some words, but really it's about the interaction and it's about chatting with people in comments and developing ideas. And the last one I did for them, I did on kind of sewing tips and I do hog hacks sometimes on my Instagram. If I have an idea, I, I share it on Instagram as a hog hack. So I did a roundup of hog hacks and I said to people, if you've got other ideas, then please share them. And I'll do a blog actually for Silver 50 and about them all. And it, what great ideas I've been sent. It's, it's really, yeah, it's been terrific. It's been expensive because I keep buying things <laughs> to for these different hacks. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that happens. Yeah, that happens. It's, it's part of being a sewist. Yeah, absolutely. Here's it. I, I read a good one on Instagram that said um, that somebody had come to realise that buying fabric and sewing are two entirely separate hobbies. And it's true, isn't it? <laughs> Very true. I'm really looking forward to reading the blog post and all the ideas that you get from the feedback from the Cyber 50 community. Yeah, the feedback on the, the hack has been quite inspirational. So I'll be writing a blog about that soon for the Silver 50 community. And I'll, I'll post it on my website, but we'll you know put it up through the community on Instagram. And yeah, there are some great ideas. I now own two pairs of surgical tweezers, for example. So. <laughs> and that's from the feedback that you've had through the Silver 50 community. Yeah, so uh, a couple of people suggested... You get different types of surgical forceps and tweezers, which are really useful for pulling like maybe a fabric through a rouleau tube yeah. or just for catching fabric. So yeah, I've now, I'm now the proud owner of a pair of, uh, pair of locking forceps and a rat tooth tweezer. <laughs> I'm hoping that listeners will understand that, you know, knowing a lot of the tips and tricks from people from the Sober 50 community can really impact your budget in a way that you didn't think about before. Yeah, there should be a health warning on the tips and tricks because it, it does mean that you immediately want to go online and source lots of things. You think, crikey, how have I managed to live without that in my life? But uh, I've, been, I've been fairly restrained this time. Not too bad. But yes, it does come with a, a warning to um, keep your purse close to you, I guess. <laughs> True. I did think with the tips and tricks post for Silver 50, one thing that struck me is just the bank of knowledge that our community has. And when you consider that we are mostly experienced sewers and we've been sewing for a long time, a lot of us, that resource is phenomenal. And it really is something that's worth tapping into. Whether you tap into it by posing a question and asking the Silver 50 community, or whether it's by, like me, trying to gather in information mm -hmm. and then collate that, I reckon we should get together and write a book. We could have a Silver 50 top tips book and I'm sure we could have it in multiple volumes. And yeah, it'd be fantastic. What a, what a great resource all of our common knowledge is. Tips and tricks, they're the sort of things that you read about and that people give you all the time. That's right. Tips and tricks are the, the one thing that, as I, as I said earlier, we all have our own ways of doing things. Yeah. 
and you realize that there's always a different way to do something and actually it might be a better way and so yeah the sharing of that knowledge is something that is a really valuable resource and should be celebrated and I kind of feel sorry for people who aren't 50 yet and don't really know about this community aren't we lucky (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but then they can always follow the So Over 50 account and then join in all the challenges, which are So 50 visible, etc., and be part of it. That's right. I know I'm, I, I'm teasing because yeah. it's open to, I think it's open to everybody, but it's it really is a force for good. I, I think it's a tremendously good thing that, that the guys are doing. So. Yeah, you're right. So Over 50 is a force for good. I'm going to keep that as a hashtag, I think. Yeah, let's yeah, let's make that a hashtag fun. Let's give them that as a Christmas present. <laughs> Jen, thank you for being on Sober Fifty Thursday on So Organised Style Podcast. You are more than welcome. It's been a real pleasure, and I'm glad it's a podcast because it's very early for me here in Scotland. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I need to go and get myself dressed now. <laughs> you look wonderful, Jen, and thank you for being on the podcast. No, you're very welcome. Thank you for asking me on. That's okay. Have a lovely day, listeners. Excellent. Happy sewing. <laughs> this episode of Sober 50 Podcast on Soul Organized Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Jen Hogg, sound by bensound.com. Many thanks for the ongoing support of the podcast Patreon contributors. On patreon.com forward slash soul organized style, you can support this podcast every month for the cost of a coffee. Their ongoing support enables me to develop this podcast for free. You can subscribe to Soul Organized Style Podcast, but with an S not a Z on all good podcast apps. Make sure you go back and listen to our free Sub 50 Podcast archive on Soul Organized Style Podcast. If you would like to contribute to the many ongoing posts and challenges the team promotes on the Sub 50 account on Instagram, direct message Sandy and the editorial team. The Sub 50 community has over 50,000 followers. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.